event tonight and, and to welcome everybody here to this Phi Beta Delta banquet. My name is John Winsaid and I'm the president of the Gamma Lambda branch of Phi Beta Delta here at Cal State San Bernardino. Um, Phi Beta Delta is a unique society on campus that has over many years now established a strong reputation as one of the strongest voluntary societies on campus, especially because of the mix of faculty and staff and students involved, which clearly is represented here tonight. Um, I'd like to mention that President Morales sends his regrets for not being here tonight. He is out of town. And likewise, former Provost Lou Fernandez, um, who is nearly always here and is a great supporter of Phi Beta Delta, is unable to be here. In fact, it took recovering from surgery to keep him away. Um, let me just say that I, what Phi Beta Delta means uh, in a couple of words, and we'll hear a little bit more about that in a minute. Phi Beta Delta, I think, is a society dedicated to the valuing of international education in all its manifestations. Its existence is a recognition of the importance of education in fostering relationships across the boundaries of countries. Um, universities, I believe, grew to their modern form out of the Enlightenment vision that took shape some two to three hundred years ago. This vision is founded on the idea that universities are engaged in producing a world built on knowledge. And universities both produce knowledge and promulgate it through teaching students. But knowledge is not, nor should not, be kept within national boundaries. It's universal in scope and in content, and we honour that by continuing to grow this organisation, which holds a torch for the values of internationalism and the peaceful relations between nations that are founded on knowing each other and on sharing ideas. That's why we're here tonight, and we have a wonderful presentation to hear later on this topic. But first of all, I'd like to acknowledge a number of the um, people who are here today in the, um, in the group who are here, and it's nice to see such a lovely audience. Um, first of all, let me ask Dr. Andrew Bodman, who's our provost, to um, stand and be acknowledged. Thank you, Andrew, for being here. We also have here Jenny Zorn, who's the Associate Provost for Academic Programs and a long-standing Phi Beta Delta board member. Kirsten, Dr. Kirsten Fleming is the Dean of the College of Natural Sciences. Dr. Terry Borman is the new Dean of College of Arts and Letters. Welcome. Welcome, Terry. Dr. Tatiana Kamenova is the Dean of the College of Extended Learning. And then we have Dr. Salam Youssef, who's the Associate Dean of the Arts and Letters College and also a Phi Beta Delta board member. You can tell because he's wearing the gold medal that he got won at, um, at Sochi around his knee. Um, Dr. Railing Chang, who's the Faculty Director for the Centre for International Studies and Programs and the Executive Director and CEO of Phi Beta Delta Headquarters. That's a mouthful, but Railing handles it all very well. Paula Mayer is the Director for the Centre of International Studies and Programs and the President of Phi Beta Delta International and Coordinator of, um, um, of um, Phi Beta Delta Branch here. Paul, would you like to stand please? Um, Dr Carolyn Eggleston is the Director of Correctional Education and a Professor in Special Education. Dr. Peter Robert Shaw is the Chair of Anthropology Department and also a member of the board of Phi Beta Delta and he also won a medal at Sochi, I see. <laughs> Dr. Rajrani Kalra, who's uh, um, a, the Secretary of Phi Beta Delta, a board member and a member of the Geography Department here. Um, and we also have here Dr. Jeffrey Miller from Haku O University, Director of Haku O's International Exchange Centre. <laughs> and a visiting scholar, Hongjia Tao, of, from, um, who's a, um, from China, I believe, is that right? Mm -hmm. Welcome, Hongjia. <laughs> um, so we're now going to um, begin our program, and we're going to hear a little bit from 
some of our board members who are going to explain to you a little bit more about Phi Beta Delta so you understand what it's about. We also have an induction ceremony with a number of new members to induct into the organisation. And this is a, a very nice ceremony um, that we will work through. I think we have 30 new members to induct, which is a wonderful, um, wonderful event to hold tonight. And then we will ha be having dinner um, along the way, and then we have a guest speaker, um, Dr. Jennifer Freeman from University of San Diego, and she's going to talk to us about the um, Women Peacemakers project that she heads up down there, which I think is going to be very exciting to hear about. So we're looking, for looking forward to that. Jennifer, and welcome to Cal State San Bernardino. Um, so, um, Dr. Peter Robert Shaw is going to come and tell us a little bit about the history of Phi Beta Delta. I think it is. We just hope the script's here because I don't have it. <laughs> many months memorizing. Yeah, yeah. It would be short if I had to do it from memory. <laughs> Um, in 1985, the Center for International Education at Cal State Long Beach wanted to recognize formally the academic achievement of international students, U.S. students returning from study overseas, international scholars, staff involved in international education, and faculty engaged in scholarly international endeavors. The staff there examined the described activity of existing national honor societies and found none which appropriately, appropriately addressed these populations or specifically focused on the international experience. Therefore, a campus committee was formed, headed by uh, Edwards Blankenship, Edward, Edward S. Blankenship, uh, director of the Center for International Education at Long Beach, and Carl Anatol, Dean of Humanities to develop an honor society which would focus on international education and exchange and also serve as a catalyst for international programming. And so uh, the Phi Beta Delta Honor Society for International Scholars was founded at CSU Long Beach. As a result of the enthusiasm of the new members of this honor society and of the university administration, several other universities heard of the forming of Phi Beta Delta and became interested in establishing chapters on their own campuses. Although it was not in the original plan to consider the development of a national honor society, Drs. Blankenship and Anatole realized from the requests and interests of individuals at other institutions that this organization would be a valuable asset to other campuses. Therefore, the organizing committee at Long Beach went back to work and investigated methods for forming a national honor society. After much research, it was decided that the chapter at Long Beach would be designated as the Alpha Chapter. The Alpha Chapter then invited a number of institutions throughout the US to consider forming chapters. The end result was that 38 institutions were authorized by the Alpha Chapter to form uh, chartered chapters. In 1987, the chapter coordinators from these 38 charter institutions met in Long Beach to establish uh, Phi Beta Delta as a national honor society. Uh, in order to recognize scholarly achievement and leadership in international education and exchange, delegates, delegates at the first meeting decided that this new society would publish a referee journal, organize annual national conferences, and recognize outstanding individuals through scholarships and awards. Other key decisions and actions taken at the society's first national conference included the establishment of the society's national office, the adoption of national bylaws, the development of a chapter manual, the assessment of membership dues, the most important thing of course, <laughs> the empowerment of the board to proceed with the incorporation of the society, the selection of Washington DC as the site of the second annual conference and the election and appointment of the first board of directors. I'd like also to tell you how we all came to be here today. California State University San Bernardino is lucky enough to have students, staff, faculty and administrators who have traveled, lived and worked in many parts of the world. In 1995, with the guiding support of Elsa Ochoa Fernandez, Director of International Student Services, a group of about 25 of us, some of us who are still in this room, got together and decided to form an organization that would enable us to find out about each other's experience and support for the internationalization of our university. 
We met at a lunch where we went around the table telling about our international travels and research. There was a genuine excitement, curiosity, and admitted wanderlust. It's quite a flowery write-up here. <laughs> As we shared our love on other countries and peoples. Although most of us had known each other throughout other, through other campus activities, we had not, before that luncheon, become aware of our global connections. We decided that it was important to nurture and expand these connections in both a formal and informal way, so we selected officers, formed the committees that you see on the back of your programs, and worked hard to nominate charter members of our group. Any of you familiar with the pace of university happenings know that it is nothing short of miraculous that bylaws were written, programs, activities, and publicity were planned in less than a quarter. <laughs> hey, so that our first induction could be held in the fall of 1995. Internationalism is a passion that many of us know is contagious. Ooh, this seems to be the last page. <laughs> and since 1995, our chapter, which is the Gamma Lambda chapter, has inducted 993 members, of which uh, 238 are faculty and honorary members and 755 student members. And I hope those numbers, they don't, yes, yes they do add up to 993. So the Gamma Lambda chapter is healthy and growing, thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. It's always get to, good to get someone from Yorkshire to read out flowery language. Yeah. <laughs> um, wanderlust. I like the way you said that too, Pete. Um, Dr. Jenny Zorn, who's a former president of Phi Beta Delta, is going to tell us about the objectives of, the, of Gamma Lambda and the Phi Beta Delta chapter. This is my speech. <laughs> Just relax. It's short. <laughs> I have the objectives of Phi Beta Delta, and its goals are to recognize the scholarly achievement of international students and scholars who have studied abroad, and faculty and staff who are involved in international activities, to serve as a vehicle for the development of academic-based international programming, to provide a network for each campus, on each campus of faculty, staff, and students involved in international endeavors, and to extend the network to thousands of members in chapters throughout the world. Now I'm going off script here to let you know about one of the opportunities we provide, and that is scholarships for our students to study abroad. And so you'll see on your tables uh, a flyer about our scholarships. And so if you can donate to it tonight, please do so. There are envelopes on the table also, or you can take it with you and send it back in later. Two of the scholarships. One is in honor of Elsa Ochoa Fernandez, our founding director, who passed away uh, in 2008. And in her honor, we established a memorial scholarship for her. She was very passionate about students and international students. And when we would read these scholarship files, and Pete can certainly attest to this, she wanted to give full scholarships to every single applicant that she, she couldn't pick. She'd say, oh, how can you pick this one over this? Oh, we'll give them, we'll, let's give them to both of them. And she was very passionate about making the opportunities available for all students. So we have a scholarship set up in her name, and we have general scholarships that, that we give out from Phi Beta Delta. And the scholarship monies come from your donations and your support, so any help that you can give uh, to help our students in their research and their study abroad would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Jenny, for going off script, and, and thank you especially for invoking the memory of Elsa Ochoa Fernandez, who is very much responsible for all of us being here today. Um, I'm now going to ask um, Paula Mayer to come and make sure that everybody understands the symbols and the um, colours that, represent, that are represented in the Phi Beta Delta uh, medallions that people are wearing and in the colours that are on the screen here. My script. <laughs> Very good. Symbols and colors of Phi Beta Delta. The Greek letters in Phi Beta Delta stand for the following. Uh, phi, love of knowledge, beta, valuing of human life, and delta, achieving excellence. 
The colors chosen for the honor society were red and gold. Red symbolizes the strength and diversity of humankind, and gold is a symbol for the sun from which all peoples and cultures draw strength and life. The crest of the society was designed with a globe, a torch, the sun, a book, and a shield. The globe represents the international perspective of the society's members. The torch symbolizes the leadership and influence of the society. The sun stands for the energy from which all cultures draw strength. The book symbolizes the coining and sharing of knowledge, and the shield represents the preservation of academic freedom. The society's motto, and uh, excuse my, my Latin, Scientia Mutua Mundi, world's shared knowledge, is inscribed at the base of the crest. Thank you. We, we are now ready, now that you understand what Phi Beta Delta is about and what it stands for and what it symbolizes, to induct our new members. Um, I'm looking for the list of new members, just one second. Do you have that, Paul? It's in the program. So we're going to have, we have 30 new members and we're going to um, ask the, some of the officers of the association to come up and help us with this um, induction ceremony. What it's going to involve is groups, we're going to do this in groups of five people. Paul is going to read out the names of the people who are going to be inducted. Then they're going to come along here and be given a certificate that um, welcomes them to, to the um, organization. Um, they'll be given a chance to sign a little book to, show, to indicate their membership. Then they will have a chance to light a candle and take the candle in groups of five over by the flags over here. And Dr. Zorn is going to give them, that at that moment, going to put the, place the medallion around their neck, which gives them the welcome to membership. So um, I think we can do this. And I'm going to ask Paul to, um, to, to um, read out the names. And we'll bring, ask people to stand and come out here. And I'll ask you to um, applaud each person individually in, in their commitment to membership. And then we'll, when you've been given your, your medallion, please hold it until Dr. Zorn puts it around your neck. And take your candle over to stand over there for a photograph. So I, I think this is probably the first time that uh, former Provost uh, Lou Fernandez is not actually doing the induction. So this is usually his statement. Um, and he really would have been here, could, could he have been here, but physically could not make it. So, the statement of induction. I, Lou Fernand, oh no. Um, <laughs> I, Jenny Zorn, in my capacity as Associate Provost for Academic and International Programs at California State University, San Bernardino, hereby install you as members of, with full privileges in the ambition and aspirations of Phi Beta Delta, the Honor Society for International Scholars. I confirm your membership based on the affirmation of your interest in the initiatives and conduct of international scholarship locally and nationally, and on the basis of the confidence invested in you by the governing board of Gamma Lambda Chapter at California State University, San Bernardino, in their certification that you qualify for membership under the established criteria of the society. When I, when I pronounce your name, I'm going to ask you to please come, come to the front. We're going to start with uh, faculty and staff and visiting scholars. The first name, College of Arts and Letters, Dean Terry Ballman. College of Education, James Hill. Also from the College of Education, Lorraine Hetk. 
The next name, Margaret Hill. Ching Ying Ying. Now the five inductees are going to take a, a picture. Very good. From the College of Natural Science, Claudia Davis. College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, Brett Goforth. <laughs> Hong Xia Tao. The next name, Manny J. Badie. Nerea Marteache. And I'm pretty sure I got this name right. <laughs> yeah. From the Center for International Studies and Programs, Mr. Adrian Alvarez. from the same unit, Nancy Lopez.
This concludes our students and our faculty and staff. And now students from the College of Business and Public Administration, Mr. Abdulaziz Al-Zamil. Fan D. Hathai Wan Bong Su Wan. Jing Peng. And Kamoldis Tiam Kachit. I just destroyed two Thai names. <laughs> Sorry about that. Feng Fei Yang. <laughs> Rafik Dou Nan. <laughs> They're telling me that he's not here with us today. Tiffany Lo. College of Education, Mr. Charles Carter. Huang Chung Yi. Okay. April Santos.
pros from the College of Natural Sciences, and also from the College of Natural Sciences, Olivia de la Cruz. Thank you, everybody, and welcome all to, the, to all of those new members. Um, I would challenge anyone to hold a candle to them. Um, one thing I just want to mention, and I haven't done this already, was to welcome a university delegation from the Hakuo University in Japan, which is visiting Cal State San Marino for 14 days. This study abroad group is comprised of 13 students and one faculty member, being led by Professor Miller, who was introduced earlier. Among the activities they are participating in are lectures in American culture, music, business, um, and, and also in language conversation groups and visits to local businesses and tourist places in Southern California. One of the main components of this program is the interaction of Hakuo University with Cal State San Bernardino students, um, Japanese language students especially, students clubs, and study abroad broad participants which uh, is a good reason for them to be here tonight. So welcome to all of those delegates from Japan and a special welcome to our event tonight. I should add that this is the fourth year that a group from Hakuo University has vis visited our campus. Um, now it's time for what you've all been waiting for, which is our um, uh, dinner event. Um, and in a little while, when you've had a chance to eat, we'll be having our main speaker for the evening. So, in the meantime, enjoy the dinner. of her project that she heads at the University of San Diego at the Joan Kroc Institute, which is a project for women peacemakers. And it was such a wonderful presentation, such an inspiring project, and a wonderful way of connecting up research and practice that I was immediately moved to think I'd love to have her come and speak to at our university. So it's a great pleasure that that has come to pass, and I thank Jennifer for being willing to come, and I'd like, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say, and I'd ask you to welcome her here tonight. Thank you so very much, John. It was so kind of him to invite me to come here. This is my first time, actually, to Cal State San Bernardino, and your campus is absolutely beautiful, um, and it's 
a privilege to be in a room with so many people who share my passion for international education and experience. I am a little bit intimidated that with so many bright minds and honor society focused on international studies that your questions in the Q&A period are going to be quite tough, so go easy on me. Um, I'm going to where I, I decided um, a few hours ago to try and add a, a different element to my presentation, which all of you who regularly give presentations know is an excellent idea, especially if it has technical implications, and this one does. So it, it may or may not work out, but I'm going to give a presentation for um, about half the time I have with you, and then what I'd really love to do is to show you a video of one of our peacemakers speaking. Uh, if this was in the fall, I would try and bring one of our peacemakers here, but as it is not in the fall, uh, this is as close as I feel like I can get, and her voice will speak better than mine um, to the power of these women. So to start things off, go. Um, as John mentioned, I have the pleasure and privilege of directing the Women Peacemakers program at the Joan B. Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice. I'm going to go into the nitty-gritty of the program in a minute, but I first wanted to start with a little bit of the methodology of why it is that we feel um, it's worth documenting the lives, stories, and experiences of women peace builders and human rights defenders um, from conflict zones around the world. That's the essence of the program and, and what we do during their two-month residency. So gender factors in conflict situations. Around the world, as, as many of you may know, um, in conflict situations, there's underlying inequalities that exist between um, in-groups, out-groups, but there's also oftentimes these linked to underlying patriarchal attitudes which create a situation for women in many of these societies that um, involves uh, disrespect or unequal uh, relations, unequal power relations, racism, and a right to act with impunity that, that certain perpetrators have in, in, in those uh, relationships. In the lead up to conflict, uh, some societies you'd say would be characterized for women as experiencing high levels of domestic violence, women having little voice in public life, and oftentimes experiencing uh, violations such as sexual exploitation. When conflict breaks out, women can be subjected to genocide and femicide. Dissent is often prohibited in these communities. Uh, rights are diminished, and there can be, as oftentimes as I'm sure you've heard and read about, um, sexual violence and rape used as part of the conflict as a weapon of war. In post-conflict periods, there can also be sometimes often an increase in domestic violence and rape for, for what women experience. There can be little decision-making power in the new public sphere. Trafficking often increases, and there could be ongoing impunity for, for people when states are fragile and rebuilding. I say these as, as some large generalizations that come from the research, but oftentimes I, it is also worth mentioning that there can be the contrary as well, of course. There are also situations in post-conflict where new spaces opened up for women to have a greater political voice or for a new constitution to be built where, where rights can be established that maybe didn't exist beforehand. Some gender differences in conflict, post-conflict, and peace building. This is kind of looking, again, very generally, but talking about the ways in which one of the reasons why we do this program is, is to highlight and look at uh, the ways men and women, again, very generally, um, experience conflict differently. What are their different vulnerabilities? What are their different capacities? So in, in conflict, targets of weapon violence are oftentimes both men and women. Displacement affects predominantly women. Social discrimination affects both men and women, but often more so women. Again, possibly coming from pre-conflict. And sexual and gender-based violence does affect men and boys, um, but predominantly, statistically, it affects women. Capacities as combatants are predominantly men. Care for family members, predominantly women. Leaders in formal peace negotiations are predominantly men but leaders in informal peace negotiations are arguably predominantly women. And the reason I add arguably 
of courses because this is very difficult to study because this hasn't been documented much. Many peace negotiations that occur at the local level and even at the national level, level but maybe in track two diplomacy or track three or four, what you may consider that, have not been documented. And that is one of the main reasons why the Women Peacemakers Program was created, to start documenting both the differential experiences of women and men in conflict and also to, do to document the women's experiences in peacemaking and peace building, which so often go unrecorded um, in history books and also for, for academics and policymakers looking for alternatives to the predominant voices that come out in conflict, which are generally those who fought the wars, those who led the wars, as, as some of us say uh, in the field, um, bad men with guns talking to other bad men with guns. So that was one of the premises that the founder of the program was really thinking of based on her work in the field that caused her to want to create uh, this Women's Peacemakers program to document the stories and experiences of women in conflict and building peace. Um, quickly, the cycle of violent conflict. This is adapted from Kreisberg. I definitely did not create this. Um, I'm about to add in what we see from the stories that we've been documenting over the years. So, very quickly, the arrows indicate the influences and factors that can affect at all stages of the conflict cycle. The root causes and structural violence that generally go into creating conflict, the way that those conflicts then manifest have both external actors and in internal actors coming in. Again, same with the escalation, the possibility for de-escalation, a settlement, and then hopefully the direction towards sustainable peace. This is not always a cyclical journey. Very often times, conflicts go forward, and then they'll go back. They'll go all the way around, and then they'll come back. So it's not a linear line. And that's, that's one of the things that we've we found with the program, is that women are active at all stages of the conflict, oftentimes in multiple stages of the conflict. But I wanted to tell you a couple quick stories, and I'm not going to spend as much time, because the woman whose video I would love to show you tonight is Zandile Nengetwa from South Africa, who's the last woman there. And she will tell you better than I ever can the way in which she was affected by the conflict, why she chose to stand up and get involved and become an activist, arguing for rights, and then also in bringing her community back together through reconciliation and forgiveness. But just to give you a couple of these examples, because as you'll see in the slides coming, we've been able through the last 11 years, 12 years now, to document the stories of 44 women from 35 different countries. So for a woman like Sarah Akuru Lochoro, she is a chief, the first female chief in the Turkana region of northern Kenya. It's a rural pastoralist region where um, the Turkana and the Pokot people have been having these small conflicts break out over cattle wrestling um, for centuries. And Sarah was personally affected. She had her childhood friend killed in front of her. She experienced a lot of witnessing the violence that comes out of these cattle raids, especially as the spears that they used to use uh, and the knives that the pastoralist communities used changed into um, machine guns, killing many more people, furthering a lot more destruction and loss of life. So she chose to stand up and run for political office, the chief title that she wears is actually a political appointment from the government of Kenya. And she has been able to get some of the first peaceful meetings between the warriors, the young warriors of the Pokot and Turkana tribes, where they agreed to meet with one another without bringing their guns, which before was totally unheard of. I could go on for a long time about what each of these women have done, but I'm going to try and keep it short. Faba Flomo, a quick show of hands. Have any of you in the room seen the movie Pray the Devil Back to Hell? Okay, you all have a homework assignment from this talk tonight. Pray the Devil Back to Hell is an incredible documentary about Nobel Peace Laureate Lema Bowie of Liberia that tells the story, it's an incredible story, of how the Liberian women came together, Christian and Muslim women, came together to end that country's conflict and to bring Charles Taylor, the dictator, to justice. 
Faba is in that film. She was Lema Bowie's right-hand woman behind the scenes, didn't want any of the limelight. And so Lema recommended her for our program. And her story really needs to be told. She was a social worker before the conflict, all throughout the conflict, and continues to work there today, um, bringing young women leaders up in Liberian society. Uh, Marianne Arnado, uh, in this, this stage of de-escalating the violence, her role has mainly been around, she was responsible for creating a ceasefire in the Philippines on the island of Mindanao. She created a civilian force made up of Christian, Muslim, and animist communities that stood up to the different uh, militia forces and the government of the Philippines um, military and said, we have a right to be here, we are invested, we are the civilian populations that are displaced when you all violate the ceasefire, so we are going to monitor you. There is no one who is going to be worse affected than us. And she was made part of the international monitoring team and she has had a central role in signing the peace agreements that have since come out of the conflict in the Philippines. Luz Mendez, one of the only female signatories to a peace accord, and Zendile Ngetwa, I won't say anything about her because she will do it herself hopefully in, in a few minutes. So as I mentioned, this, these are the stories of women that we have documented over the years. The process that we follow is to have a call for applications every year. It's actually going out on Saturday. Um, and we receive between 100 to 200 applications from all over the world. From there, we select four women. Different religious backgrounds, different levels of education, different areas of expertise and experience. But the reason that we select them is because they have worked for usually over 10 years, many times over 20 or 30 years, in their own communities, bringing their communities back together, calling out human rights violations, or building peace. <coughs> this is the stories, these are the stories that I feel like we so often do not hear. These are images of our peacemakers working all over the world. Stories that I don't feel like we, we know about how our peacemaker from 2013, um, Philister Lawiri, she's, she's right here in the corner, she was um, one of the election commissioners for South Sudan. She was instrumental in having the referendum held that created the new state of South Sudan. And then she was instrumental in creating an election process where women represented 52% of the vote. Prior to that, do you know how many women had voted in, in Sudan? A handful, because apparently you had to have a PhD if you were a woman in order to be able to vote. Any man could vote. But for women, you had to have a PhD, and there were only a handful in the country who could vote. So this is two lines, that middle picture on the bottom, of men and women on the other side. The line with women was for lactating mothers and children. They were allowed to bring their, their children there. There were services to support them. They were given time off in the day. It was held in the hours. Their, their voting times were scheduled so that they would still be able to conduct the work that they needed to do within their communities. This is, the picture above is Rahana Hashmi in Pakistan. She's, she knows Malala Yousafzai, um, the youth, the woman who was shot in the head uh, by the Taliban. She's leading a protest. She speaks out against um, women's rights, reproductive rights, um, a lot of domestic violence. She calls out the government, she calls out the Taliban, she'll call out anybody in Pakistan. She's fearless as we were trying to interview her for the program last year, she was in hiding and we had to keep switching the telephone numbers as we were calling her. The methodology we use, I usually don't get this far in a presentation without actually talking about it, but we use a method of reflective peace building and narrative inquiry, whereby a pe every peacemaker is paired with a professional writer and she spends two and a half to three hours every day, five days a week, being interviewed. The methodology has developed because we feel that women who are in conflict situations, who often are working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, many, many, many of the women that we select have not had a vacation for years, years and years. They live and breathe this work. The methodology of the program of reflective peace building is a chance for them to stop, to rest, 
and to really reflect deeply on what it is that they've done. Why did they make the choices that they made? Why did something work and something else didn't work? Was something really as effective as they thought it was? What were their motivations? What were their leadership strategies? Why did they choose to stand up even though it meant personal risk to them, their families, and their communities? So through a process of having somebody ask them questions respectfully, gradually, and follow the vignettes of the storylines that they have, that is how the process of telling their story works. Their story is then documented in the genre of creative nonfiction in short vignettes along with a conflict history, an integrated timeline that looks at the events of the, of the conflict and how the woman peacemaker's life fit into that. Where was she when this peace agreement was signed? Was she involved in it? Um, and, then, and then they are shared free and online on our website and on other free publication websites around the world. This is just a couple, I'll read them quickly for you, the quotes of what the peacemakers say when they have this opportunity to document their stories. This isn't meant to sell the program. It's just, it's just interesting to hear what, what it is that they get out of it, which we, we got these quotes at the 10th anniversary, and I don't think we had known at that point that the program had had this kind of effect on, on the peacemakers. So the top one says, this is from one of our Pakistani peacemakers, as an activist and an NGO leader, I never got even a little time to think about myself, my peace strategies, or any leadership behavior. One reason people don't change is that they do not take the time to reflect. But the program provided me with two precious months of reflection and changed my life. Luce Mendes, who as I mentioned before is one of the only female signatories to a peace accord, and that was for Guatemala. The process of telling my story was a very significant experience in my life. It made me to systematize my own struggles and at changing the lives of women and the whole society in my country and other places in the world towards gender justice and social justice. That experience strengthened my self-esteem and commitment to confront, to continue struggling in that direction. Many women who come to us are burnt out and ready to stop. And I think that that's one of the most important elements of the program, is that they get to meet other peace builders, see that they're not alone, they're not the only ones struggling in these situations, and get their sails refilled to go back out and continue the work. The other things that we do while they're there, in addition to having them interviewed every day with their peace writer, is they give presentations on campus, both at USD and at other college campuses around San Diego and actually Southern California. We often host an international working conference while they are there to bring other stakeholders like the military, um, academics, students, uh, members of the judiciary, lawyers, um, security forces and others, and international activists from around the world to talk about some of the pressing issues that they're dealing with. We go to the United Nations every year. I'm on my way there next week actually to present on the things that we learned from the program and what the peacemakers are focusing on right now. And we're hosting international summits. As of 2011, we started convening the women regionally. It was their idea, as most of the program's ideas are. And they said, if our government leaders are meeting and our military leaders are meeting, why aren't our peacemakers meeting? So they're starting to, to get together and, and talk about the issues and share their experiences with women in the neighboring countries from our alumni. Now I'd like to take a break. If I haven't gone too long, do we have 15 minutes, John? Okay, and I'd like to let you hear from Zendile. As a quick opening, yes, please do cue it up. I just wanted to let you know that this was at our 10th anniversary conference where this photo was taken. This is outside the Institute. Um, and we had, we had these panels with, with experts from all over the world. So Zendile was sitting on a panel with uh, somebody, the head, the only, uh, now, gender advisor to the head prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, um, the head of the uh, Women, Peace and Security Program at UN Women, other very important um, activists from, from Lebanon and elsewhere. And everybody gave their pre presentations. This was about the importance of transitional justice. And the audience was wowed and it was, it was incredibly fascinating to hear what these, these big important uh, NGOs and individuals, leaders were doing. And then Zandile spoke, and you could hear a pin drop in that room. 
She is a lifelong activist and peace builder. And what I would like you to listen to here in her address is how she talks about the way that the conflict affected her and her community and why she chose to stand up, the roles that she took on because she couldn't stand by and watch the injustice happening around her, and then you'll hear her own story of, of how it affected her life and what she chose to do, how, how the dichotomy perhaps between work and her, the personal effect on her met. So. In the light of what has been said this morning, I will share my personal journey of healing and reconciliation. I was born and raised in KwaZulu Natal in South Africa. And it was during the apartheid era. And I think most of you understand that these were laws that dehumanized people. These were laws that were violent and very oppressive. These were laws that undermined human life and human dignity. And these were laws that inculcated the culture of violence in the beautiful country of South Africa. I think what we witness today in South Africa is the different forms of violence that we see. And this, and all this was born by the apartheid laws. It, it fragmented communities, it fragmented family units, it fragmented values and dignity, which is the social fabric of the African society. I grew up there and I married an activist. My life did not change that much because I was used to raids. I grew up with that in my family, with police coming in at night demanding permits. So it continued when I was married in my own home. My husband was taken for interrogation, beaten, and released at times. Abnormal as it was, but it became for me the order of the day. And one day he did not return, he was murdered. And a year after that, my children who were three years and six years old, during the state of emergency, which said that all children, all school going children, need to be in class by 8 a.m. And somehow they were within the premises of the school. But the army would go and enter the schools and take any child that was outside the class after 8 a.m. And my children became victims. They spent the night in jail, three years, six years old. And not only the many South African children all over the world because of the state of emergency. And these painful experiences define the child of my life. I realized there and there that I could not raise children in this sick, sick community in society. I knew I needed to contribute in that country in a valuable way. I started getting involved in women's organizations within the community. I was a teacher at that time. And in each and every class in South Africa, there was a soldier with a gun. It was highly intimidating for the children at that time. It was intimidating for us as teachers. And I started, the children asking us questions. Why are the soldiers here? Why is this happening? Why are the tear gas in the school? Then I began to tell the story of the sick government that we're under. And as I continued doing that, a couple was very close to me <coughs> and had become my support system, was killed. 
And uh, as we had arranged with them, I adopted their son. So I was raising three children. In the midst of all that pain, grieving the loss of my husband and my friends, my house was burned down. I knew it wasn't safe anymore to live in the area. I left and went back home. It was at the height and the peak of violence in KwaZulu Natal during those days. But for me, that was home. I started meeting with women who were widows from both the political side to begin our own healing process. And then a big issue in South Africa, we had demo democratic elections. And we all knew that this was a, a negotiated settlement. The TRC was put in place, which was looking at the human rights violation, which was giving credibility to the, to the law systems. But was that enough to provide forgiveness and healing for South Africans? It happened at a high level. It was about the defense force. It was about specific individual case, cases on the ground. It was about the police. It was about a little bit about the liberation armies. But that process of forgiveness, which was powerful, it was needed by South Africans. The country was at a boiling point. I think if the process of reconciliation was not put in place, we would not have a country today. But that powerful, wonderful process did not filter down into the communities, into, into the impact and the effects of the apartheid system. I worked for an organization at that time that worked at a grassroots level. And there were recommendations by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that our young people were in the forefront of violence and they needed healing and communities needed healing. And as we worked in these communities, sharing facilitating issues of reconciliation and forgiveness. I suppressed my own pain and my own loss for all these years in order to move on and function. And one evening I was coming from an evening with a colleague of mine and my adopted son. We had to drive past a community which was very notorious for criminal activities. We knew that we, had not, we should not stop at a traffic light. And as it slowed down, we fired by bullets from all sides. And my son was hit and just slammed. And we drove on to the nearest clinic and he was certified dead. I was engulfed with anger and pain and hatred that I could not even explain even today. I knew I needed justice at all costs. And I used the influence that I had. My husband was an activist, I was an activist. I used the influence politically inside and out and out of prison. And within 24 hours, those guys were arrested, four of them. They were all underaged. But because of the pressure and influence that we put <coughs> in, they were not released to their parents. The trial went on, supported, I had a strong support from non-profit organizations and NGOs and friends. The trial went on and they were sentenced, all four of them, they were between the ages 14, 15, and 16. They were young boys, they were kids.
And after that, I went back home. On my way home, at the end of the trial, a mother of one of those boys approached me. And, and she looked at me in the eye and said, she shook her head and said, you've acted as if you're not a mother. You've acted as if you're not a woman. You've acted as if you do not understand what's going on here. <clears throat> I could not translate it properly. He said it in Zulu. But it became so deep to me when I went home. These words lingered in my heart and mind. For years, I continued my work of reconciliation in the community. Um, the work was, was recognized nationally, including the government. But I knew I was a hypocrite. I was preaching something. On the other hand, I was behaving the other way. For me, it was justice, not reconciliation. And the stories that I heard in the community were similar to mine. And I was facilitating forgiveness and reconciliation. I was glorifying my pain. I realized that all these years I'm, gl I'm glorifying my pain. And the women that I've met with, and the families that I've met with in communities, have opted for reconciliation and forgiveness, but I've, I was still harboring anger, hatred in my heart. I took a decision to walk on this journey on my own, to approach the families of these young guys. It was a difficult process for me. But the emotions that I had at the time of reconciliation were beyond the risk and the fear of stepping into the water, which I did not know how deep were these waters. I visited the families, the mothers. When I approached the family, I did not know where they lived. I knew the area. I did not even remember their faces because during the trial, I was so engulfed in my anger, so I had no picture of these women. As I approached this home where I was directed to, the lady was outside. She quickly recognized me, and she fired me with all sorts of insults. I stood there and listened. And he said, you know what, I don't want to see your face here. Just leave. I left. I reflected on it, and I knew this is the right thing to do. After two weeks, I went back. And she did the same. The third week, she invited me in. And she said, what do you want to say to me? And I said, I want us to talk about the words you said to me about being a mother and a woman. And we started to share. Started to share me how she was brought up, how she ended up in that informal settlement. <coughs> how she had raised the children single-handedly, how she suffered during the apartheid and during the liberation struggle. And the only means of survival was to sell Likha and Daha within the community. And that was the first meeting. Because our stories were long, we could not finish. We scheduled another meeting after two weeks. And when I came back and visited, she had invited the three other ladies, and we started to talk and share. It was quite a painful process for all of us, but it was a process for all of us for healing. 
And after two weeks, I visited again. They invited other women who had children in prison. And as the press process went on, more and more women from the community came in so that we could share our pain and reconcile. And we began to identify things that women could do within that community. And we invited other organizations to assist these women within the community. But my journey of reconciliation was not complete because I needed to visit those false young men in prison. And that was the hardest part to go to prison. I kept on delaying it, but eventually I knew it's something that I had to do. And I went to prison. as they were called by the wardens to meet me. They couldn't look at me in the eye. I could not either because of the pain and the suffering. I could see one of them was losing weight. I just held hands with them. And there were tears coming from both of us and these young men who were going to stay in prison for between 15 years to 20 years because of the other crimes that they committed within that community. And when I left that day, I felt that relief in me. I felt as working in the processes of reconciliation I was being honest. I felt I was deepening the processes <coughs> that the truth and reconciliation had begun. I felt I was reconciling communities that were along politically, that were divided along political divisions. And for me, that process changed my life. And I realized that it was the core of what reconciliation was about. And the community is continuing. It has rippling effects. And it's growing to other communities. And these stories of these women was broadcast over a local radio station. They were given a slot for about 13 weeks and this is a radio station in South Africa that has the most listenership. And that was sharing the stories of reconciliation with the rest of South Africa. And that was my personal journey of reconciliation. Thank you. this program as a peace writer and I can say I feel like I have never in my life had a better job than getting to sit every day and hear a woman's story like Sandile's and to share that with the world I feel like is a very very important and valuable lesson so thank you so much for listening I'm hoping we may still have a few minutes for question and answer um, Anybody has any questions or areas you'd like me to go further on? Does anyone, anyone like to ask any questions or at this point? I know it's hard to follow someone like that. <laughs> not come up from one of the parties involved in this? Um, I don't know that you can. I would. I wish Sandile was here so that she could answer that question for you better than I. But I think that that is the message. I think that in sharing our stories, 
and in sharing stories who have gone through that process, somebody who has found a way in the most unlikeliest of circumstances and situations to forgive or reconcile with, with the other, with, with somebody who has violated them or hurt them in some serious way. I think that that's, that's a way to plant those seeds, is through people hearing that, it's like it gives us permission to rethink where we may be storing anger or animosity in ourselves, where we may be inflexible in our ability to move beyond and possibly what the benefit of doing that could be. Somebody once described to me that, that trauma or hatred, those, those wounds, those things that happen to us are like shards of glass and our bodies may form scar tissue around those but they do still move and every time they move they create a little bit more inflexible scar tissue and if we really want to move forward and heal ourselves we have to reach in and get that out and whether you feel that that is through forgiveness and reconciliation I think is, is a personal journey for all of us but I think listening to Zendile convinces me at least that that is a clearer path to health than to continue to harbor those those hatreds. Anybody else? Well, you really are going easy on me. Are you sure? <laughs> question about the Peace Center. How many people are employed in it? How many people are employed in the, in the Peace Center and sort of a, an idea of how the center actually operates? Yeah, absolutely. So within the University of San Diego, the Croc School of Peace Studies has two practice institutes, which actually predate the school. Joan Croc was um, generous enough to endow first the institute when she created the building. And then at the time of her death, or shortly before, she said that she wanted to actually have the academic component to teach students how to, to make peace in the world. So the Institute for Peace and Justice um, was charged with not just talking about peace, but making peace. So we have a small staff, but we have um, projects in a number of different countries. We only work in other countries when we're invited in by local partners. Um, the countries where we have projects right now are in Nepal, where we've been working for over 10 years. Um, we've worked in um, Kenya, Colombia, Guatemala, Cambodia. Many times, and especially in recent years, we've been partnering more and more with our peacemakers and their organizations. And I do want to emphasize that the peacemakers, as you saw from Zandile, don't just work on what we would consider to be gender issues. They, most of them have gender-based violence or specific gender equity components of the work that they do, but all of them are specialists in a given area. Some of them are human rights lawyers, some of them are politicians. We had the first female prime minister of Haiti. Um, there are police chiefs like uh, Sarah Lechodo. Um, and so in the different areas of working with peace and justice, um, they often ask us to partner with them and connect them to other people or help them with facilitation of, of different activities that they're doing or even just bring an international presence to raise the profile of the work that they are doing like an international solidarity visit. Um, so the staff is about, there are about eight of us right now and we're currently working our current projects are the Women Peacemakers program and a program focused on youth called Worldlink which brings about 700 youth from San Diego schools and schools across the border in Tijuana to the, to the university um, once a year for what they call a youth town meeting. And these 700, I think it was up to 750 students this past uh, January, create the entire program for the conference. They choose the topic, it's youth speakers, it's youth moderators, it's youth journalists, and they run the entire day to teach each other about global issues. And again, the issues that they have decided each year that they want to focus on. So the WorldLink program and the Women Peacemakers program are our two landmark programs. And then our program in Nepal that's been going on for over 10 years is our biggest field 
program, working with a number of local partners throughout the country. And then we've got a violence prevention program in Kenya, working between the youth and the police, because a lot of animosity developed there when they had the post-election violence in 2006, 2007. So we're working to build some relationships of trust and having those two groups start talking to one another. Um, and then we're working in Cambodia with one of our former peacemakers, um, with women who want to become involved in the political um, arena, political sphere. It's, it's very, very hard. There's a very dominant party there. Um, so as long as we're working across political lines, we facilitate leadership um, training, political training, mainly facilitating women finding out what their common issues are and working across party lines to try and elevate those um, in the political spheres as well as in their community. So those are the main programs we're working on right now. Yes? I'm struck with, particularly in the video, I'm uh, surprised at the similarities with the tenets of restorative justice mm -hmm. and I wonder if you use some of those tenets in your work and what kind of relationship you have with that. Absolutely, we have a number of faculty um, and practitioners that we, we work with that are part of the Croc School that work specifically on restorative justice. Um, sometimes, this may sound funny, but the peacemakers that come, Zandile is somebody I consider to be like the mother of all peacemakers. She's somebody that I just love to hug and she is the sweetest, most amazing woman. But a lot of the women that we bring to the Institute, I am answering your question in a roundabout way, are feisty. I mean, they have been subject to incredible things and they're used to standing up for their rights. They're very strong leaders. So they're not always the most peaceable personalities. So sometimes there's conflict. They live together in a casa in two two-bedroom apartments, and that's, that's part of the program, is for them to live together and learn together as well. And so we've used even elements of restorative justice or mediation when there have been conflicts in the CASA, bringing in our colleagues and, and working together with them. But also in the field, we do, which I think was, was probably your larger question, um, we do work with, with groups if they ask us to, those, those of us staff who have that as part of our background, will facilitate workshops, and as much as possible, work with local, identify and find local partners that have those skills, and, and work with them too in those processes. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, I just want to finish by thanking Jennifer very much for a very interesting, very inspiring presentation, and for introducing us to Zandile as well. Um, I was moved to think about how you can listen to the news and you can hear uh, stories often about the leaders who are the politicians who are often men who are, get all the kudos for doing the peacemaking but actually what we are hearing through the voices of these peacemakers and through the words of Zandile herself is often the much more important grassroots work that actually makes things shift and change in different places around the world. So, I think it's important that the work that you do honours these people, honours the work they do, gives it other layers through being storied and through being publicised, and I imagine this is um, to be very inspiring for the people concerned to continue to do the work that they're doing. And so um, thank you very much, Jennifer, for the work that you do and the work that your centre does to make all those things happen. Thank you. And that brings our evening to a close. Um, thank you for attending, everybody. We look forward to seeing you again. We will be having an event in the um, spring quarter um, when we will actually be holding our scholarship banquet, um, which will be giving scholarships to international um, students and, and for the work that they are going to be doing. And we uh, look forward to having you all attend uh, that event. We will also have another speaker. We have to determine who that will be at this point, but we're looking forward to that and hope that you will be able to be joining us on that occasion. So thank you very much for coming tonight and wish you all a good night. <laughs>